Hello and welcome to Access Chat, where we're delighted to welcome John Macko from Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, Rochester Institute of Technology is a very prestigious university in the United States and has a reputation for working on inclusiveness. Um, so, John, it's a real pleasure to meet you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to work in the field, and also um, about the work that you're now doing at RIT? Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is John. I'm the director for the NTID Center on Employment. NTID means what? The National Technical Institute for the Deaf. At the Rochester Institute of Technology, we're one of the nine colleges where we have the College of Science, College of Business, College of Engineering. We also have the College of the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. This is where we have a total of 18,000 students on campus. Out of the 18,000 students, we have 1,100 deaf out of fame students from all over the United States come to school in Rochester, New York. Now, you may be wondering why we have so many deaf out of fame students. Um, do you, I'm sure all of you went to college, right? Yes. Do you remember your first day of college? I'll ask Neil this question. Do you remember your first day of college? Well, I remember the morning of the first day. My memories are a bit foggier um, after the morning. But yes, I, I do. But how did you feel that day? Uh, nervous. Okay. What else? Ex excited, privileged. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it was a mixed. It was a mixed sense of emotions and feelings, and daunted to a certain extent to be. Uh, at, at such a prestigious institution. Okay, thank you. I'm so happy how you describe your feeling because that was the answer I was looking for. The reason why I asked that question because in master you are a person with disabilities, especially if you're deaf or high hearing, you're the only one going to that university. Mm -hmm. Suppose you were deaf, Neil. How would you feel that day? You're the only deaf person on campus. How would you feel? Uh, probably isolated. Okay. What else? Uh, would, you feel more, would you feel more overwhelmed? Potentially more, not just potentially more overwhelmed, but 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 also um, there's the whole fact that you need to be teaching other people how to communicate with you, finding out how you're going to get the information, looking at all of the access needs and everything. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot more to it than just turning up, uh, finding your room, and then finding the bar. I am so happy you said that because you're right. Many of the professors, this is if you if you are the only deaf person at a university, it's the professor's first time having a deaf student class. If when they find out you're deaf, they're like, what do I do now? How am I going to teach you? What communicate strategy do we need to discuss? So anyway, um, the reason why we have so many deaf out of history is because the awareness level is very high here. The college professor, they're comfortable having deaf out of history. NTIG has been around for 51 years, and we have over 9,000 alumni have graduated. So we're pretty successful. And also, we have more than 145 sign language interpreters on campus and 60 captionists. Understand that you're not required to know sign language to go to ROG. You're not required to know sign language. If you don't know sign language, fine. There's other ways we can communicate in the classroom. So our um, college professor, they have a lot of experience, and plus they're comfortable having deaf artists in the classroom. So that's the main reason why we have so many deaf artists. And also, RIT, most programs require to do an intern or cooperative education. If you don't do it, you won't be able to earn your degree. So, for example, if you're in a business program, you need to do a total of 20 weeks of intern related to your major to earn your degree. If you're an engineer, you got to do a total of 50 weeks. And that's why we have so many deaf high defense students on campus. So anyway, um, I'm the director of the NTID Center on Employment. It's a career center for the deaf high defense student. I have a total of nine people on my team. We are responsible for training our students to find jobs. We don't find jobs for our students. We teach and develop their resume. 
the cover letters, practice interview, how to apply online, all that. We also work with companies all over the United States to make them feel comfortable with the idea of hiring deaf people. Now, when we're working with companies, what do you think are the top three concerns that we address on a daily basis when we're working with companies? I would say the, the, the socialization within the organization. Can you, I would, can you elaborate by, so, by socializing? Can you elaborate? So uh, the, the way our employees network with each other, how they collaborate, how they socialize, and how they integrate within, the, within the, that company community. Yes, in other words, how are they going to communicate together? What are the communication strategy if it's one-on-one, -on -one, small group, large group? How will we communicate? Do I need, what um, assistive technology are available to provide communicating in the workplace? And that's, that's number one. What do you think is the number two concern? And I will give you a hint, it starts with the letter S. Will I get sued? No, I mean, no, no. Oh, you would not believe how common that concern is. But it's it's sad. But yes, I mean, there are other ones too. But uh, go on. Deborah, you go for a less combative S. No, no, I, 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 was, I was thinking the same word, so I... Um, yes, I, I'll, I'll give you another I, hint. There is a difference between working in a, in a bank or in an IT environment as opposed to working for a manufacturing, engineering, or a chemical environment. What, would, what is that word I'm looking for? It starts with the letter S. Security. Okay, the second letter is A. We got S, Safety. A. Safety. 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 Okay. Yeah. Safety, wow, because people are deaf, that, wow, okay, all right, because we don't understand the culture, all right, good point, good point, I didn't even think of that word. Yeah, because when you're working in a chemical environment, if there's an emergency, how well a scientist, a deaf scientist here will know that there is an emergency, how would they know? So those are the things we discuss with the company, we're in a consulting role. So we, talk, we cover safety. And the last concern that we address on a daily basis is start with the letter A. Advocacy? Well, yeah, well, um, the word I'm looking for is accommodation. What is the cost of providing accommodation? Oh, okay. Companies are concerned about the cost of providing accommodation in the workplace, and that's number one. But really, the number two is they're not familiar with the products or the service that you can offer as part of the combination. For example, if you have a deaf employee requesting a video phone or a video relay services, there's a good chance that the companies, the HR, the hiring manager, and the recruiters, they have no idea what a video phone is. How would that benefit deaf people using the phone? They don't fully understand that. So my team, we're in a career center, working with the employer, working with the student, we're in the middle. It's our job to bring both parties together. When they come together, we don't tell the companies, please, please hire a student. No. If they are qualified, if they have the skill, hire them. And we will work with you to make sure you make that smooth transition from college to the workplace. Also, when we're working with the students, we tell the student, you need to be prepared. You have to do your homework. If you do your homework and you're ready, there's a good chance the company will hire you. And that's how we work together as a team. John, so, so pretend like I'm an employer, which of course I am. I'm an employer and I, I've heard that hiring a diverse workforce is good for me. And um, I thought maybe I would start by hiring some qualified candidates that are deaf and hard of hearing. How do you even begin to help me? Because I know that 
you know, there are things that corporations probably wonder, are you going to charge us to do this? Or are you, you know, how do we, you know, support what you're doing? But what does the process look like as far as you supporting an employer? I guess it doesn't have to just be a corporation, but any employer that that knows that they need to be more diverse. They understand the value that somebody that was born or grew up deaf and hard of hearing can bring the creativeness and the innovation they can bring to the workforce. But where do we even begin? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked. Um, we don't charge anything for doing business. We don't charge anything. We're there to support you, to help to meet your needs. First, we will find out what are you looking for. If you tell me we're looking for IT specialist or a programmer or an engineer or a machinist, let us know what are you looking for. If that's if we have them, I'll let you know we have them. And then the next step is send me the job description. Then I would share with my team. We would pass it on to our student. Let them know there's an exciting opportunity to work for XYZ company. Please send me your resume and apply online by in two weeks. We give them a deadline. We collect the information. We will send it to, to the hiring manager, recruit or HR. And that's how we can start the process. Also, we always invite the company to come on campus because from our experience, many of the hiring manager, this is not sure. Can this work? Can Deaf people become engineers, uh, accountants, uh, graphic designers, and the answer is yes. But we always invite them to come on campus, we give them a tour, connect you with the faculty, they give you a quick overview of the program, then we introduce some of the students to find out where they're from, what's their major, what project are they working on. It's a nice way for the representative of the various companies to make that connection. I'm a strong believer that is the actual way to build the relationship, the, the partnership. So that's the process that we follow. Excellent. Antonio, I know you have a question. I'm quite curious to know about the, the type of work that you do with your student, with your professors. So I'm sure you have uh, lectures that are going to be on that role for the first time, okay? And they have uh, students uh, who are there for, uh, and how do you, what type of work do you do with the professors to make sure that they, they you know, first of all, they feel confident in themselves within the classroom and they actually do a good job, uh, you know, as educators? Okay. Um... I need to explain more about RIT. I mentioned that there's nine colleges. At the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, our professor, they sign in voice. I mean, if you're hearing, but if you are profoundly deaf, they sign only, that's fine. And that's how we communicate. They have direct communication. But for the eight other colleges, you know, the College of Business, Engineering, Science, Liberal Arts, and so on, Many of these professors, they don't know sign language. This is where we provide sign language interpreting or captioning in the classroom. And that's how we're able to communicate with each other. Now, I am proud to tell you that the professors, many of the professors have industry experience. They, they know what it takes to be successful in the workplace. So they're able to pass on their knowledge and experience to the students because you should understand, our students who are 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're deaf and hard of hearing, they're not sure if, if they have the ability to be successful in the various industry, in the engineering, computing, um, liberal arts, business will. They're not sure, but our professor, they're in the role to encourage it. You can do it. I'll give you an example. There's a lot. Um, last year, we have an annual NCID career fair where we had a total of 54 companies from all the United States came on campus to recruit the deaf hard of hearing only. The best part of what company were able to send a total of 54 deaf professionals. 44 have graduated from 
from engineering RIT. It was awesome because, again, our students, 18, 19 years old, they had never met many successful deaf people in the various workplace. And yes, I can explain what the company's looking for, but it's always better for the student here from the deaf professor who's very successful. It was a wonderful experience. So that's how the professors, my team, and the student and alumni, that's how we all work together to be sure our students have the appropriate resource to be successful, because we want them to be successful. Absolutely, that, that's super important. Deborah, I know you, you wanted to follow up on this, or you had another question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. I, I was wondering, the, technology is certainly becoming a good equalizer. It's, it's not there yet, but it's getting there. W what are some of the new technologies that you are starting to use to support the students um, in the educational system, but also when they go into the employment? And I would um, also be interested in some of the corporate brands that are supporting NTID. Hopefully, um, th hopefully you can hear my question. Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, the, the, the newest technology that we are encouraging soon is to use ASR, which is automatic speech recognition. On your iPhone, there is an app called Microsoft Translator, where suppose, suppose, I mean, I'm deaf myself, but I can speak for myself, but suppose I was profoundly deaf, I was not able to understand. I would ask the hearing person to download the app and then use start talking. Then I can read what the person's saying. Then I can type, I can type where the hearing person can understand what I'm saying. That is the newest technology uses. What I'm learning is that it is important that our student is comfortable using that technology. Not all students are comfortable using automatic speech recognition system. They're not comfortable using that. Also, when you're working with the hiring manager, is the hiring manager comfortable using that technology? If there's, it's depending on the manager and the coworkers. Some people are comfortable, some people are not comfortable. And this is where our students are learning to figure out which technology is gonna work. I'll give you another example. We did a study for three years our student, when they're on a co-op for the first time, we discovered that 80% 80, 80 of our students on co-op for the first time did not ask for accommodation. You may be wondering, wow, 80% did not ask for accommodation. Why is that? There's many reasons. One is, it's their first time working in an engineering environment, a computing environment, a business environment. They're not sure what to expect to when you work in that environment. They're not sure. So they're not sure how often um, do bosses have weekly meetings? How often do you do you have to communicate with a small team every day? They're just not sure what to expect. But when our student do their second or third co-op, they have a better understanding what accommodation they need to request. They know how, they're more comfortable advocating themselves. They understand who to contact to make the arrangement. But when it's the first time, they're just not sure. It's just part of the learning process. By the, by the time they graduate from college and they find a full-time job, they're more comfortable advocating themselves. Plus, many of the companies that we work with, they're comfortable hiring our students. They have that experience. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 you know, very keen for us to help people talk about these stories and, and for, uh, I work for a large company, so we've got a hundred and plus thousand people working for us globally. And, and so in order for us to socialize that and to, uh, for, uh, for managers to feel comfortable, we've got to create stories uh, within our own organization that they, they that they can feel comfortable so um, 
sometimes we have to sort of virtualize what you've you've talked about so I, I think it's great that you're able to take people into RIT to see what you're doing and I think that that we then need to find ways of replicating that experience within our own organization so where we've already made accommodations for our employees we need to be getting our employees to talk about that and our managers to talk about what we've done in terms of accommodations or we call them adjustments in the UK um, and and for people to tell their success stories so that we're making sure that that people don't feel daunted by taking on a new employee with a disability or a new employee who is deaf or, or hard of hearing because we do have the technology and we do have the knowledge within our organization it's just that it's not necessarily present with that manager so uh, reducing the fear is, is is important and so do you also I know you're here today talking with us do you also go out uh, and, and, and talking about this at conferences or and at um, you know at, at, at uh, external you know yes you had the the dedicated employment fair but do you also do this at at more general employment fairs because i'm very keen to see inclusion in the in in the main workforce and and beyond us you know having special cases you know and special employment conferences although they are needed yes neil um my team, we travel all the time, all over the United States, working with companies. We give presentation. Is it an employee awareness program where we gave it a taste of what it's like to be deaf or high of hearing? We have um, videos. We show videos of what it's like to speech read. For example, we will show you four different scenes, the narrators that will guide you, and then the voice will be turned off. Now you have to watch the scene and guess what the person is saying. Because let me ask you a question. Do you, this is a general question. Do you think that people are great speech readers? Not naturally. That's, that's an art that is learned. And also it depends on how someone is speaking. So I'm conscious now that I'm speaking to you uh, and I'm conscious that you will m more likely want to read my lips as well as look at the translator. So I am speaking more clearly, more slowly, and uh, making sure that I open my mouth and I face towards you so I'm not doing this because that makes it a lot harder, right? Yes, yes. Um, there are some hearing people believe that deaf people are great sp at speech reading. Then I always tell them, let's watch the video, see how you how you feel. So after watching the video, it's really short, about five minutes. They're like, wow, this is difficult. Now they understand why deaf people are requesting a combination in the workplace because not only in their speech reading, you're right, Neil, I can hear you, but I can't understand everything you're saying. For example, um, if all of us were to fly to Japan, we're in Tokyo. If you don't know the Japanese language, can you hear the Japanese talking in, can you hear the language? That's the question. Can you hear them talking? The answer is yes. But can you understand what they're saying? If you don't know the Japanese language, no, you can't understand. That is the best way for me to describe my hearing loss. Yes, I hear everything, but I can't understand everything. I love to listen to music. I will recognize that you two, the Rolling Stone, Frank Sinatra, or that's jazz, or that's rock, I'll recognize it, but I don't know what they're saying word for word. And that is the best way I could describe my hearing loss. This is why I request these accommodations, having live caption, having a sign language interpreter. That is how I'm able to communicate with hearing people, especially in the workplace. So, um, so we do travel, give a presentation. We also have a, another activity it's called a listen exercise where you're going to hear 12 interview questions. And again, let me ask you a question. 
I know Neil. I'm going to praise you, Daniel. You know, when you first saw Nassim, well, what did you do? When I first saw... When like, you couldn't see well. Uh, I ignored the fact for quite some time before finally um, admitting I had to get some glasses. So um, I, I, I tended to just sort of stare harder, give myself a headache. Uh, in my wife's case, what she did was buy an A3 printer and print everything out A3 instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> an accommodation, but not the right one. Yes. So, the process was you went to see an eye doctor, you got the exam, you told you need glasses. Yeah. Now, when you got yourself a pair of glasses, you were able to see better, right? Yes. It's, yes, almost it's, it's almost 100%, right? Yes. Okay. Now, from my experience presenting, many hearing people think that if you can't hear well, get yourself a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. And okay. I tell people it's not the same thing. Yes, it helps us to hear things if we have the ability to hear something. But what people fail to understand is we can't understand everything. And this is why we need captions. We need a silence of term. This is why we need paper and pen. We need our iPhone to text each other. There, there are many different strategies, strategies to communicate in the workplace. And, and they are important. And also, yeah. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, one day, I get a phone call from a hiring manager. He was trying to figure out his budget. He, he just hired a deaf person full time, and he has a weekly department meeting every two weeks. When he was doing the math to figure out his budget, it was, it was a lot. So he called me to say, John, what am I going to do now? And I say, time out, time out. And I asked him a general question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Antonio this question. Antonio. In order for you to be successful on your job, what resources do you need do you need to have to be successful? What resources do you need? This is a general question. Well, uh, uh, I need uh, access to uh, organize company resources, computer, phone. Uh, I need to do the different uh, areas of, you know, where, the different offices where they are located. You know, you know who is doing what, and if and if is there someone, uh, let's say if I work in an office, who is the person that manages facilities or uh, that I can go and ask a question? Yes, thank you. You also need a desk. You need a chair. You need paper. You need pen. You need all that. Suppose the company don't provide you that, can you do your job well? No. 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 Okay. No, no. Now, who pays for all those supplies? No, uh, uh, the organization, the employer. Because they're, you know. Great. So they have a line item that's called, for example, office supplies. They have a budget set aside. They use that money to pay for those resources for the employee to be successful, right? Yeah. So, do you understand where I'm going with this? I know, I know. I'm working with this hiring manager. Okay, you're right. It costs a lot of money to pay for the interpreters for one year, but it's no different than what you provide chairs, desks, computer, iPhone, paper, a pen, and so on. So I'm helping the hiring manager to build a case to present it to the upper management. So they're trying to set up a centralized funding where any manager that has um, a person with disability on the team, they have access to the fund to pay for accommodation. And that's another thing we do when we work with companies. No, but John, I, I can say, you no. Know, some organizations already have uh, individuals within the organization who have someone to help them, and they don't really they don't really know. Uh, no, uh, they might be in a senior position, but you know, uh, uh, vice presidents, CEOs, other executives, they might have a personal assistant, and they don't really know. 
the, that's related with the volume of work. So, but they already have them. So I think there's somehow a parallel between them and the person that needs accommodation. Yes, I mean, it's part of educating, explaining how it could work. And also another strategy that works well, suppose I'm working with XYZ company, there is a successful hiring people with disability. I have a new company who's interested in, I will explain what you can do, but I also would connect them to the SYC company. They could share their experience. What do they need to do to make that smooth transition for a person with disability to join the workforce? So that's another strategy we use to work with them. Also, when it's speaking of new company, it is important that you start small. I've worked with companies, they're so excited, we want to hire many deaf people. I said, wait a minute, start small. Is it important that you identify the right managers who is willing to give our students an opportunity? Because there are some individuals that are just not comfortable with the idea of hiring people with disabilities, especially deaf out of hearing. Is it important that you identify the right person who is willing to give that person an opportunity? And when when it's working, then we'll ask the hiring manager, do you know another manager at your company who will be willing to give our student an opportunity? And that's how you grow over time. But when, you, when it's a new relation, you want to start small because that is the best way to, it, it'll become a win-win. When you hire deaf people, also the company looks good. Uh, John, I, go on, Deborah. John, we, thank you, Neil. When you think about talking to employers about your talented, qualified students that um, are that are deaf and hard of hearing, what what would you like to say to an employer? Because one thing that I've seen and I've heard over and over is that when employers actually hire people that are deaf or hard of hearing, they're actually they're often surprised at just how smart they are, how innovative um, and creative and what natural problem solvers they are. Um, but what, what do you, what would you say to employers that, you know, they're, they, they just don't understand the positives of what's going to come to them? Um, and I, you know, and I don't know if I'm asking that well, but uh, I think there's a lot of hidden benefits that people just don't know. And I was wondering if you could address that a bit. I, I understand your question. It's a great question. Um, I always tell company when you hire that people, all of you become a better communicator. What do I mean by that? Some people learn sign language. Some people learn to take good notes. If you're the hiring manager, you have a weekly department meeting. It is important that you set out the agenda so the people know what's going to be discussed. Also, during your department meeting, as an example, you set up a rule that if only one person can speak at a time, at a time, only one person at a time. You know how when you're at a department meeting, people have so many ideas, everybody's talking at once, you need to set the stage. One person, one person speak at a time. Um, so I, I've learned that after the meeting, the boss should meet with the deaf person, have a what I call a debrief section where the manager will ask the deaf person, tell me what you learned in the meeting. And the deaf person will explain. Then the hiring manager will say, you're right, here's an important information you need to, you need to be aware of. So the boss will share that information. And that's, where, that's what I mean. Everyone become a better communicator in the workplace. It's, 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 it's exciting, it's different, it's a different way of communicating. And also, people are using technology to communicate. You're using your uh, text, you're using your email, you're using um, um, the relay, you're using tech, this various technology. So you become a better communicator. I think there's some parallels with, for me, learning how to be a better writer through using assistive text. So I use speech recognition 
and 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 what that teaches you is to think about what you're going to say before you say it because the speech recognition doesn't act very well if you're stopping all of the time and and saying one word at a time it likes you to say a a sentence all in one go and speak clearly so you have to think before you actually uh before you start speaking so so again the working with assistive technology and working with people with disabilities forces you to 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 get better at things and to do things in a different way that that actually improve your overall performance well yes yes um another thing um i tell people that many people know sign language and many people say i don't know sign language i go yeah you do and I tell people, right now, you know more than 200 words of sign language. And they're like, no. I go, yeah. I'm telling you, you, you know more than 200 words of sign language. So I'm going to ask Debo as an example, how would you sign the word phone? Right. How would you sign the word computer? Hmm. Maybe... Yeah, you're typing. Right, computer, okay. How would you sign the word credit card? Right, you yeah, swipe that it. One I... Yeah, oh, you swipe it. Okay. You swipe it. Um, how would you sign the word, um, hey, Tony, how would you sign the word eat? Right, eat, okay. Nia, yeah, how would you sign the word drink? Okay. I, we can go around and around. I have a list of 200 words that people know sign language. <laughs> but I will tell you this. In the workplace, people are not comfortable using their body language. They feel foolish. They feel silly. But I tell, I tell the people, guess what? We can hear any better. This is the best we can do when communicating. But you have the ability to learn sign language. We are, if you are, we're not expecting you to be perfect, but pick a word there or pick a word there. We appreciate that you are making an effort to using your body language, learning a few words. And that is, is in this, again, you become more comfortable with yourself in the workplace and you become a better communicator. Right. Give I've... me hope that I can learn sign language. I want to learn it. John, you need to send us the tip sheets because I want those 200 words. Yeah, yeah, I'd be glad to send it to you. Now, I understand, yeah. speaking of sign language, each country has their own sign language. Like the British, they have the British sign language. We have the American sign language. We have the Japanese sign language. We have the Italian sign language. Each country has their own sign. So I just want you to be aware of that. And also people ask, how long does it take to learn sign language? It depends on each individual. There are some individuals, they can master the language pretty quickly. Others, they, they, they process and they process and they process. It's, it's not that simple. It takes time to learn a language. And the best way to learn a language, you need to be into that culture. You need to interact with deaf high parents who's using it every day. It's the same, if you want to learn how to speak Japanese, you need to hang out with Japanese people. That is the best way to learn the language. Yes, you can read it, you can watch it in a video, but the best way to be in that environment. Yeah, I, I think going back to um, some of the advantages of em employing people who are deaf and, and also signers, what you're doing is complex. You're actually speaking two languages at once. Yeah, you're speaking English and signing. So w what you're demonstrating is a capability to multitask that is really highly developed. That has to be good for businesses in the modern age. Well, well yes. Um, I tell people that there are, there are many people who are deaf or had hearing in this world. And there are, they are your customers. If you are able to provide accessibility, if, if people want to order something online, they need to make sure the video is captioned. 
if the video is captioned, then there's a good chance that hearing people will buy your product or the service. And that's another, that's, that's another benefit. There are people, social conscious, they want to know, are you hiring people with disability? Are you hiring the people? And if the answer is yes, it's good for the business. It's good for everybody. Absolutely. So I, I think we're, we're at the end of our half hour. It's been a, a real pleasure talking with you and, and learning about the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, it's, it's really uh, inspiring, and I don't use that word often, uh, but, but what you're doing is you know, at, at great scale, and, 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 and that's what's so inspiring for me. Um, so thank you very much, John. I'm, I'm looking forward to you joining us on, on Twitter next week uh, and looking forward to hearing more about what you're doing because this I'm sure is something I want to follow up. I uh, also need to say thank you to my clear text and Elaine and, and the crew for making sure that we have captions, Barclays Access and Microlink also for supporting us and keeping the lights on and, and the wheels turning and, and of course to Julie and Sarah, your sign language interpreters. Thank you, thank you. It was, I enjoyed having a conversation with all of you. It, it was it was a pleasure. So thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day.